Hello, folks. We are here to talk about Agile principle number eight today. It is such a hallmark of good software development, yet I find that sustainability is the sort of conversation we have about the planet and the ecosystem. You talk about a sustainable pace when you run a marathon, a sustainable pace for learning something new, uh, you know, sustainability in healthy ways of eating, but why does it need to be spelled out when we talk about software development? Because it does. So if you're interested in knowing what this Agile principle is all about and what are some of the things you should be looking into when you're coaching your teams and departments to get better at it, then watch this video. Let's get started. Agile principle number eight says, Agile processes promote sustainable development. The sponsors, developers, and users should be able to maintain a constant pace indefinitely. You might have been lucky enough to not have lived any uh, so-called death marches in the software development. And those were those moments in which it's do or die. We have to deliver now and by this date. And that meant that people would work, no joke around 60 hours a week and they would sleep on the office and you know just pour some coffee and have some code coming out um, i had the pleasure of living some of that in the late 90s and early 2000s and let me tell you i think you can understand that this is not sustainable and you can imagine the level of lack of energy and stress that you feel as an employee and the kind of decisions that you make and the quality of code and of work that you generate under these conditions. So it was very common at that time, late 90s, early 2000s. So it really did need spelling out and that's what this Agile principle is all about. It's about, hey, what if we stop and consider how can sponsors and users come talk to us developers so that we can all work together in a pace that feels good for everybody because it feels good for everybody we can maintain that indefinitely that is a constant pace that we can all accept and abide by so i've been around the block not only having lived that but also having coached teams and departments in organizations that were very big or rather small and i could start then understanding that what comes into this principle being active or not being active has at least two layers to consider one being the human aspect i should say and one that's more related to technicalities so let's look at each of those so on the human side of things what i will be looking for is i'll be asking myself and the people what are the systems in place that make people behave in that way, overworking or acting as heroes coming in, you know, Friday night and still being logged on the company Slack channel. Because we need to understand that in the human level, even though on the surface, it might seem that the conditions are awful, you know, overworking never looks nice. The reality is that human beings will always behave in a way that they have, you know, some gain from it. We have to be gaining something. So let's say, of course, it's awful to be overworked, but maybe you are the one getting all the accolades in the end of the month, or you're the one getting the better bonus. And it's unfortunate, but people do operate in this way. So we want to understand what are the company policies or the unspoken agreements that exist in the company culture that makes okay for people to behave this way. So either it is very appealing, even though it's unhealthy, or it's at least okay. And if you don't behave that way, you're kind of actually in some shape or form punished or not being perceived as just as good as employee as someone else. Another piece of this human component that affects sustainable pace for development is, are the teams and departments really siloed and really apart? Because when we are not talking so very much or when we, we see work completely different, what happens is that we are missing pieces. And we're only gonna notice those missing pieces when we bring our work together and when we do some sort of integration of code or pieces of our product. And in that moment, what's going to happen is that 
all the things that we assumed and all the things that we didn't consider, they will be very apparent in all the pieces of the work that do not fit together. You can also consider the decision-making process. How do decisions get made? When decisions about the delivery of a product get made way, way far away from the development team, there is a, a certain loss of contact with reality in there in such a way that some of the promises might not match the pace and how people, how quickly, how fast and how good people can develop their solutions. So it's not really by mistake that in this agile principle, they describe, you know, bring together users, sponsors, and developers, everybody conversing, everybody talking and deciding together. Then there is this last piece that I want to comment on when you're coaching for the sustainable pace on the human level. It's considering, once again, what is written, what is spoken, but also what is not very visible about the uh, how people live their lives outside of work. Is there an incentive for people to really make sure that they are out there with their family, with their friends, no workaholism being encouraged? Um, do we really take care of mental and emotional health of our people at work? And this goes from, are people taking the time off sick when they are sick? Because we're humans, we're not always in top shape. And when you have to just push through when you're sick, is it really the best idea? Is it really what the company needs from you? Are you being encouraged to take your vacations and really just live a life outside of work? There is also the aspect that, you know, sometimes it has to do with how much of yourself you can be at work. What kind of spaces exist at work so that you can voice your concerns and work a little bit more in a way that is suitable to your style. Maybe you're quiet, maybe you're someone who speaks a lot. And the, the important part is that sometimes just that kind of stress, maybe if you don't have a stress of a tight timeline, but you have a stress that is, that's being put on you on how you should behave at work, that is actually the sort of thing that can make you still be kind of like on the edge. And that feeling on the edge and that feeling stress definitely won't help you be working in a pace that is sustainable for you, even though the timelines and the work part of things really do seem okay. So for the Agile principle number eight, there are also more technical components that you can look into and I will also subdivide them. I think they are related to technicalities of the backlog and work management and those that are related to the actual technical infrastructure. For the backlog and work management piece, I think the first question that you should dare to ask really is how is uh, backlog management? How is incoming work being accepted or rejected, if at all? Because you will notice that is not uncommon when you look at the annual direction or quarterly planning, especially in bigger organizations, that you will see that when you think about the, the objectives of the quarter or of the year, they are plentiful, they are many, and that will mean then that the teams have to deliver against several objectives. And once you have more than one thing to focus on, at some point they are competing. So as a developer, as a, a worker, now I have tasks that are competing at each other, competing priorities. When priorities are clear, they are ordered. There's no competition. If I need to drive my kids to school and if I need to go to the pharmacy, I will have to make a decision on where to stop first. And it should really be the same for projects and for deliverables. And that still holds true when change happens. In fact, shift will always happen. That's the very nature of why we decide to adopt agile ways of thinking and agile ways of doing things. So when changes happen, they are not exempt of prioritization. In fact, it's very simple. If I want to respond to this change in a certain way, what do I do with the work that I had decided, the priorities I had decided before? I will have to make a choice. Something will have to go down on the priority list if something else goes up. 
Another piece I would pay attention is um, in how the Agile principles are intertwined. I think we discussed it before and we always kind of will because one thing really leads to the other. Agile principle number three is the one that asks you to integrate your code early and often because only when we integrate code or whatever pieces of work is when we can notice if things are really working well together, if there is something missing. And then there's Agile principle number seven, where we were saying working software is the primary measure of success. I could say right now that things are 70% done, and that doesn't really mean that we have successful working pieces. And your sustainable pace depends enormously on how well your pieces are working together. So it's just a reminder that all the things that you were coaching for, they, they really come together to support a sustainable pace here. The final blind spot is really in the technical infrastructure itself. And remember, maybe you're not an agile coach that understands the technology, the technology of marketing or the technology of software. It doesn't matter. Maybe you don't understand how technicalities really work for your teams, but you do understand that a technical environment where they need to put their work together and see if things work together and fit together is something that is required. So you definitely want to make sure that you're coaching and facilitating the discussions that leads to that. It can be because of a process. It can be for a lack of a tool. It can be because of misunderstanding. But you do want to make sure that the technical issues are addressed. Because if it's always very painful to integrate my work with yours, what happens is that we're going to do it less often because we're humans and humans want to avoid pain. So you see that even though it's going to cause a huge pain in the end, I'm kind of like choosing that because I, I feel like I can postpone and I enter this vicious circle where we don't have the pain of integrating right now and we leave it as a huge pain to integrate only in the end of the process. And never mind that if you don't understand the technicalities, that's the moment where you either trust your people they know the technicalities and they can figure out solutions. But if you wish and if they wish, always consider that you can have a more technical coach, someone that can really teach them and, and help them in, in the more technical aspects that they need to grow on. I hope this video gave you an idea on how to go about coaching for sustainable pace. Remember that in the end, Sustainable pace is just a good business. You have quality deliverables early and often delivered in the hands of the customer, which means that the customer is really happy, which is great reputation for you. Your employees are very happy, which is great retention rates of your talent and employee morale. That means that the bottom line is going to be great, which means revenue and shareholders are happy too. So it is a very virtuous circle if you take care of the sustainable pay. So that's an agile principle not to be ignored when you're coaching your agile teams. If you have any comments or questions, you know where to find me here on the internet. But I would say the best way to really find me is going to allthingsagile.ca, subscribe to the newsletter. It is bi-weekly and I share insights there that I don't share anywhere else out in the internet and you can definitely have a more direct line and ask me anything that you want and I answer you right away just by hitting a reply in your email. I'll stop this video right here and I see you in the next one. Bye!